Here I'll discuss the law of total probability. Let's first look at some plots as a motivator, and then look at a more formal expression of the law. Suppose we have a sample space S, and in that sample space we have three events, B1, B2, and B3, represented by these three regions. And suppose, as illustrated here, these three events are mutually exclusive, and they are collectively exhaustive, meaning they take up the entire sample space. We sometimes say that the Bs are a partition of the sample space. Now suppose we have another event A in this sample space, here represented by the blue ellipse. Note that the entirety of A is made up of its intersection with the Bs. A is equal to the union of these three intersections. And that would be true of any event A, whatever A happens to be, since B1, 2, and 3 make up the entire sample space. If A looked something like this, for example, then A is made up of the intersection of A and B1, and A and B2, and the intersection of A and B3 is the empty set. Any way you slice it, A is made up of these intersections, since the Bs span the entire sample space. So here, A is the union of three intersections. And since those intersections are mutually exclusive, because the Bs are mutually exclusive, the probability of A is the sum of the probabilities of those three intersections. This idea generalizes to any countable number of Bs, and any way they divide up the sample space, as long as they are mutually exclusive and they span the entire sample space. If the Bs are not mutually exclusive, then we might end up counting some parts of A more than once. If the Bs are not exhaustive, then some parts of the sample space are missed, and thus we might miss some parts of A. And if there are only two Bs, in which case we typically refer to them as B and B complement, then the probability of A simplifies to this. This is a useful little identity that you should keep in mind. So now on to a more formal statement of the law of total probability, which I think will come naturally if we keep these diagrams in mind. Suppose B1 through BK are mutually exclusive and exhaustive events in a sample space. In other words, exactly one of them will occur on any individual run of the experiment. For any event A in that sample space, the probability of A is the sum of the probabilities of the intersections of A and B1 through A and BK, which we could express in summation notation if we wished. There's an extra layer to this that I have not yet brought up. Recall that the multiplication rule states that the probability of the intersection of A and B1, say, is equal to the probability of B1 times the probability of A given B1. These are always equal. So we can re-express this total probability equation substituting that multiplication in for the probabilities of the intersections. And in the end we get this, which we could express in summation notation this way. The statement involving the conditional probabilities is the more useful one, and the one we typically mean when we speak of the law of total probability. Note that it follows directly from basic probability rules. If we keep those diagrams of the sample space in mind, and we know the multiplication rule, the law of total probability drops right out. What does it do for us? Well, those conditional probabilities might be the available information in a given situation. And if we also have the probabilities of the Bs, that will allow us to bring those together to get the total probability of A. Or a complicated problem might be made a little simpler by breaking it down to more manageable chunks, then bringing them together. Let's work through some examples. Three machines make parts at a factory. 60% of the parts are made by machine 1, 30% by machine 2, and 10% by machine 3. Each part is made by one and only one of the machines. Of the parts machine 1 makes, 7% are defective. For machine 2, 15% of the parts are defective, and it's 30% for machine 3. Suppose a part is randomly selected, 
and we want to know the probability it's defective. What information are we given? If a part is randomly selected, the probability it came from machine 1 is 0.6, the probability it came from machine 2 is 0.3, and the probability it came from machine 3 is 0.1. I'm letting M1, M2, and M3 represent the part coming from machines 1, 2, and 3, respectively. Note that these are mutually exclusive events that cover the entire sample space. The randomly selected part will come from one and only one of these machines. And we know the conditional probability the part is defective, given it came from machine 1, is 0.07, because 7% 7 of the parts machine 1 makes are defective. For machine 2, that conditional probability is 0.15, and it's 0.3 for machine 3. Here I'm letting event D represent the event that the randomly selected part is defective. We've been asked to find the probability the part is defective, and this is a classic case of a job for the law of total probability. We have the conditional probabilities of a defective part for a set of mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. And so the probability of defective is the probability machine 1 made the part times the probability the part is defective given it came from machine 1 plus the probability machine 2 made the part times the probability the part is defective given it came from machine 2 plus the last term corresponding to machine 3. All of these probabilities have been given to us, and we can fill the appropriate values in. And we're left with this. The probability a randomly selected part is defective is 0.117. One way to think of this is that we're weighting the conditional probabilities of a part being defective by the probability each machine made the part. Machine 1 makes a high percentage of the parts, so the overall probability of a defective part is drawn towards its probability of making a defective part. Some people prefer to visualize this type of situation with a tree diagram. Let's have a look at that. Here I've drawn a tree diagram with the first branching representing the machine, and then a defective, not defective branching. The probabilities on the machine branching are the raw, unconditional probabilities the part comes from each machine. The probabilities on the defective branching are the conditional probabilities conditional on that particular machine having made the part. To get the probability the part came from machine number one and it being defective, we multiply the probabilities along the branch do a similar thing for the other two branches. Now by adding up these three probabilities, we get the probability the part is defective, just as we did on the previous page. Tree diagrams are just a useful way of visualizing the situation. Once we're comfortable with probability calculations, we often do these sorts of calculations quickly, without thinking formally about the law of total probability. Let's look at another question, where we'll work through it a little faster. One of these four urns is randomly selected, in such a fashion that each urn is equally likely to be chosen. Then the balls in that urn are thoroughly mixed, and one ball is randomly drawn. What is the probability the ball is blue? Well, the conditional probabilities for each urn are easy to find here, as since we're mixing up the balls and randomly picking one, the probability of getting a blue ball is just the number of blue balls over the total number of balls in that urn. For example, the conditional probability of drawing a blue ball, given we're drawing from urn 1, is 4 out of 10. Now we can use the law of total probability. The probability of getting a blue ball is just 1 quarter times 4 over 10, plus 1 quarter times 1 out of 7, plus 1 quarter times 3 out of 8, plus 1 quarter times 5 out of 9. This works out to approximately 0.37. A question for you. If instead we put all the balls in one urn, mixed them up, and drew one ball at random, would the probability of getting a blue ball be the same? I'll let you think about that. I spent many a Friday night in my teen years working on urn-based probability problems. And as much fun as they are, sometimes it might be hard to see the practical benefits. But the law of total probability does have many practical applications, 
and it plays a big role in Bayes' theorem, which is a very important probability topic that we'll talk about another time.